Hello everyone. Today I want to show a game played in 1994 in Buenos Aires tournament uh, between Alexei Shirov and Yurit Polgar. Let's check it out. It starts with e4, c5, we have the Sicilian, knight f3 and e6, the Paulson variation, d4, c takes and knight takes, knight c6 and knight c3 and d6. And white goes for g4 immediately and a6. So it's a kind of a knight off like with shaving in structure. Bishop e3 just developing and knight g e7. Because if knight f6 then uh, g5 were, were to come immediately anyway. Uh, knight b3 avoiding an exchange in the center and b5. Uh, since there is no knight uh, uh, knight trade happening, uh, black can expand on the queen side. Uh, f4, advancing on the king side, and bishop b7. Uh, X-raying the e4 pawn, and queen f3, all standard development. In fact, this position had occurred before uh, in Shirov's game, and in that game, uh, Sh uh, Shirov had the white pieces, and Kasparov was playing with the black pieces. And knight a5 was played, just trying to exchange some pieces and opening the line of the bishop. Um, and white castled after knight into b3, a into b3 was played, instead of probably c into b3, which might have been slightly better. But after rook c8 and h4, continuing the pawn advance on the king side, knight c6 and even g5, continuing with the pawn stop. And queen a5, king b1, preventing any infiltration. And knight to b4, keeping some pressure on a2. And after bishop d4, black could successfully execute d5. The knight b4 also uh, supports the d5 square, so uh, black was slightly better, and this game ended in a draw. But Polgar came up with uh, a novelty here after queen f3, and she played g5. A very interesting move that she's uh, advancing pawns on the king's side. Uh, even though white is the one who is threatening a pawn storm there and uh, we expect that black should castle kingside but that's not the case uh, so very imaginative indeed uh, the idea behind is to mess up uh, the pawn structure for white and to gain some key squares uh, there could be responses perhaps like for instance castling is a response but that allows g into f4 so the massive pawn Clump has been broken up. After bishop into f4, knight can come to g6. This is all acceptable for both sides. Um, but Shirov chose to capture. He grabbed the pawn. And, well, it's incumbent on black to show that, well, what do you have for the sacrificed pawn? But e5 square is vacant now that the f4 pawn is gone and knight e5 comes in right away putting some pressure on the queen and on the g4 pawn, and queen comes, tucks back to g2, just defending the g4 pawn. Uh, b4, dislodging the knight from c3. Knight goes to e2. And here comes a very interesting idea. Black has already sacrificed one pawn, but why not another? h5. This opens lines for black's pieces and uh, the idea is to gain some activity so for instance you can castle here just ignore the pawn maybe give back a pawn you could capture with the g uh, with g into h6 which is fine and after bishop into h6 and bishop into h6 and rook into h6 and then castle perhaps knight g6 this would be okay for both sides there are chances on both sides Although white, uh, black, the black king is in the center and probably the queen will move and the king might castle queenside and tuck away there or maybe stay in the center, either way. There, but the, the, the knight placement on e5 is quite good for black here. That's one thing to note. Um, apart from that, there could have been, let's say, castles immediately and h into g4 and knight g3. Acceptable. Just give back the pawn. Both sides have one side as a pawn on g5, one on g4. Shirov chose a slight inaccuracy. He went with 
H captures on G5, and it seems quite reasonable that uh, it seems, yeah, if uh, white were to capture with the rook, it's fine. Knight G3 will hit the rook anyway, and otherwise you have two connected pawns. But what it does is it gives up control of the f5 square, and knight f5 comes straight away, and we see that the e4 pawn is pinned. Uh, this hits the bishop, so bishop has to tuck back to f2, and the queen captures g5, so one of the pawns has been recovered. Of course, if queen into g5, sorry, sorry, if queen into g5, then simply knight f3, and after king d1, you will pick up the queen, and black is doing quite well. Again, the f5 knight is off limits because the rook on h1 would hang. So this is quite fine. Uh, after queen into g5, probably the best way could have been to do knight e takes e to d4, covering the f3 square. Now you are threatening queen into g5. The bishop on f1 can move as well. So perhaps knight h4 attacking f3 again and attacking the queen so queen into g5 knight into uh, f knight f3 king d1 and knight into g5 that could be an alternative very decent for black as well and but it uh, but it would have been slightly better perhaps to go for this line because after the queen into g5 knight a5 was played attacking the bishop And what it does is it allows knight e3. Now there is no scope to capture this knight because if bishop into e3, then after the queen takes, there's a very strong threat of knight f3 check. And let's say you grab the bishop, knight f3, and you can't stop mate on, on d2. This is the threat. And very beautifully, if the queen is taken now, knight f3 is actually checkmate. A very interesting and very beautiful smothered meat indeed. So after knight e3, which hits the queen also and also threatens the c2 pawn, which with a fork, queen g3. Attacking the knight again, black trades queens, knight into g3 and knight c2. King to d1 and knight a1. The rook is gone and the bishop is taken so. Uh, now, it may seem that the exchange sacrifice is worth it because the black knight is trapped, but that's not the case. There's an interesting move here, simply b3, covering the c2 square, so there's an escape path for the knight, and if after a into b3, simply knight into b3, so knight escapes, and black is ahead in material. The game continued for some time, king c2, knight c5, offering a trade, knight into c5, d into c5, and bishop e1. Knight to f3, going for some more trades, bishop c3, avoiding, and attacking the rook, and knight d4 check. King d3, and bishop d6, just developing the last piece. Bishop g2, and bishop e5. King to c4, the king is coming up the board, but that usually is not a, uh, a great thing till we reach the end game. King e7, connecting rooks, and rook to a1, and knight c6, just going back, offering a trade of bishops, and at this point, white resigned. There isn't much play. Uh, the, the bishop will either capture a knight or exchange itself with uh, the other bishop. Black is doing quite fine and if bishop takes a uh, line could go something as, as a sort of after knight c6, king into c5, bishop into c3, b into c3 and rook h c8. I'm saying king c4 and knight e5 check. King d4 and f6. Black is quite solid and there's a passed a pawn which will be marched down the board eventually so we see so a very interesting game uh, by polgar and this uh, the novelty of g5 in this position was something quite remarkable that's why i wanted to show it and also the queen the h5 the second pawn sacrifice also is very praiseworthy 
and of course queen to g5 that idea of activating the queen that way was also very very interesting well, thank you all for watching i'll see you soon for the next game